Hey there, my name is Alex, I am the Silvermont, and this is a starter guide for Red Dead Redemption 2's online mode, Red Dead Online. There are timecodes on screen and in the description if you want to skip to a specific part. I'm planning on covering a lot of aspects to help you plan out or get the most out of the game, so whilst it might seem a little overwhelming, I'll try and keep it as simple as possible. If you have any questions, or tips, or advice that I just missed out or wasn't plain aware of, please do leave them down below in the comments. And that out of the way, let's get started. Creating your character is fairly obvious, but there's a few things I want to note out as I see some people asking questions about them, specifically stats and the character's build. There are two types of body variable you should be aware of, body type and weight. Body type is what you choose when creating your character. You can create a skinny character, athletic, brawny, and so on. This has no bearing on your stats or playstyle. However, once you get into the game, you can adjust your character's weight when it comes to diet. If your character is overweight, you'll drain stamina faster, but gain damage resistance. If you are underweight, the reverse. Weight also works on a scale from 1 to 20, 1 to 9 being underweight, 10 being perfect, and 11 to 20 being overweight. Naturally, different items of food will put on more weight than others. Chocolate will have more calories than a stick of celery. The game seems to work on a system of caloric intake. Just as an example, if your character has an intake of 10 calories a day, and a chocolate bar is 5 calories, then having more than 2 chocolate bars in that in-game day would start to increase your weight. My character has consistently been overweight because I feed him on big game meat and alcohol, both of which are high calorie. The other part of character creation would be stat allocation. You have a few stats that you can freely move around between health, stamina, and deadeye when making your character. Each of these can also be raised in the game once you start playing. In my opinion, it is best to put all of your stats initially into health, as I think that's the slowest and hardest one to raise. And here is a quick breakdown of the different stats. Health raises your total hit points. It can be raised via the following fist fights, fishing, throwing weapons including dynamite, and bows, and rowing a boat. Stamina raises your total stamina, allowing you to sprint and swim further. It can be raised with the following, sprinting and swimming. Honestly, it's so easy to raise stamina just by running around. My tactic was to expend all of my stamina by jumping constantly, especially if I was about to mount my horse, because riding a horse doesn't require any player stamina. Dead Eye, which raises the amount of your, well, Dead Eye meter. It can be raised with the following. Headshots and Dead Eye kills. Cooking and crafting. Hunting and skinning. All three are important, but depending on your playstyle, you may be doing more of one thing than the other. In my case, I would say health is the most useful and also the hardest to do, as you have to go a little out of your way more so than the others. But you can put your points wherever you feel is best. I just think health is the best one to go with. Honor is like weight, in that this will change depending on how you play the game. High honor comes from looking after your horse, taking certain choices in missions, and helping people. Low honor, well, go and attack and kill random people and be a rudeness vortex. There are some story missions tied behind low honor and high honor too, it's worth pointing out. And there is an NPC in the game who you can go to and pay him, and he will instantly swap your honour to the opposite. Once you've made your character and played through the tutorial though, you're good to go. Rank is simple in Red Dead Online. Just about everything you do in the game will give you EXP that ranks you up. Once you hit rank 100, you've reached the maximum in that you'll no longer get things unlocked with your rank, but you will keep ranking up. You can get to rank 200, 300, and so on. If you're looking at the game's battle season pass, the outlaw pass, so to speak, that ranks up every time you get EXP as well, although it is separate from your rank, because they require different amounts of XP to increase. Standard experience will apply to both your rank and your outlaw pass rank. The Outlaw Pass itself has a free version and a premium version, which usually costs around 30, 40, 50 gold. You will typically get all of that gold back in increments over the course of levelling up the Outlaw Pass. 
So if you have the gold, I would always say it's worth doing, as it doesn't take too long to rank up these Outlaw Passes either. So if you're wondering, is the Outlaw Pass worth it? Yes, if you have time to complete it. Then we have the game's currencies. Red Dead Online has dollars and gold bars. Dollars are gained from just about everything you do in the game. You'll typically have more dollars than gold bars, which are earned in the form of nuggets. You can also buy gold bars with real-world money. Incidentally, there is also a way to gain some free gold bars if you head to the Rockstar Social Club website and set up two-step authentication on your account, you'll get around 10 gold bars free, assuming that promotion offer is still running. I think it is. Gold bars are generally used to buy specialised equipment and the rolls. You can also use gold bars to buy things that you aren't high enough rank to unlock normally, although I'd not suggest this unless you really want that item. Best way to get gold? Get your daily streak going. Every day, the game will give you seven daily challenges, plus more for every role you have unlocked, that award you a small amount of gold. If you do at least one of these a day, it will start a streak, and that streak will increase the multiplier on your rewards. For example, if you hit the maximum streak multiplier, which I think is 21 days, you'll be getting half a gold bar for every challenge. If you did every challenge, you'd be getting a few gold bars a day just from those, not including the rewards from other activities. Gold is one of those things. Once you have it, it's easy to keep getting it. You just need that initial stockpile to keep you going. So it might be worth to buy a couple of gold bars to start out just so you can unlock the collector or the trader role. But beyond that, you probably would never need to buy it. And if you're patient, you won't need to buy it to begin with. Gotta spend money to make money. Using treasure maps to find treasure chests in the world can usually ward a little bit of gold and some decent amount of dollars too. So always be on the lookout for NPCs willing to trade you maps for a few dollars. They're always worth it. And you can always just kill the NPC or just rob them and take the map if you're a rude person. But they cost like five dollars, which is nothing. As for dollars, we'll be talking more about those in the role segments later on, but if you're wondering the best role for getting a lot of money, in my opinion, the best roles would be Trader and Collector. Collector gets you a huge amount of money for exploring and gathering items and then selling them as a set, a collection. Whereas Trader, you just need to hunt and hand in animals and then sell all the materials at once. The other roles aren't great for generating income and are more for other bonuses, varied gameplay or just fun. If you want money, Trader and Collector, that's where the money's at. Although, like everything, they both require some investment. For Trader, you'll be wanting to buy the wagons. For Collector, you'll be wanting to buy the metal detector and the shovel. Ability cards are a large money sink in Red Dead Online, so you won't really be looking at them right off the bat. You can get by without them, although in PvP they are a lot more important. And I haven't mentioned it much yet, but I won't be talking about PvP too much in this video. For two primary reasons. Number one, ability cards and special ammo types render most game modes a nuisance to play, in my opinion. But what are ability cards? In essence, you buy them, you level them up, you upgrade them with more money, and they apply bonuses to your character. It allows you to build your character in a specific way. For example, you could make your character built heavily on defense or offense and so on. Whilst they are certainly useful in every game mode, even against AI, they are a lot more important in PvP. You'll have one ability slot dedicated to your Deadeye, and then three more for passive abilities. I won't cover every ability card, but I'll talk about a few from each segment covering either my favourites or some noteworthy ones because they're so damn strong. For Dead Eye cards, we have Paint It Black. This is my favourite Dead Eye card. It allows you to paint targets on enemies, then release Dead Eye to shoot them all at once. It's a little hard to describe, but it's really useful for a sort of pop shot on enemies. You just, you move the crosshair over an enemy, it paints a target, you release, you instantly fire, get that amazing headshot. This is typically the one I would suggest to get right away, as I think they give you it free, as you get one ability card free at the start. And I would generally say pick this one, it's always a good pick. Slow and Steady. This is a really good PvP card. Slow and steady means you can't be one hit with a headshot whilst your Deadeye is active, which is obviously a huge advantage. It also causes you to take less damage when Deadeye is active, but you can't sprint. 
It's good for PvE as well as PvP, but this is a kind of specialised PvP one. Slippery Bastard. When Deadeye is active, players can't look onto you. AI are less accurate, and you can't look onto other players. I believe this also renders people using Paint It Black and Deadeye kinda useless against you when you have it active. But Deadeye also drains faster. Again, it's a good PvP one. Next up we have the passive cards. Strange Medicine is another good PvP one. Every time you inflict damage, you regenerate a bit of health. However, standard health regen is half the normal speed. Cold Blooded. My usual choice. Killing an enemy causes you to regenerate health over 5 seconds. Nice for PvE. And also PvP, but more so PvE. <laughs> Fool me once. You take less damage when you are shot consecutively. Great for combining with slow and steady, for obvious reasons. Those two are kind of what you'd get when you're going towards a kind of tanky PvP character who can just absorb damage. Never without one, your hat blocks a headshot, but flies off in the process. If you aren't wearing a hat, you take more damage. I generally use this one because I don't PvP too often, but it helps if someone's trying to get the drop on you in free roam, and it gives you time to drop them instead. There's a lot more ability cards, but they are expensive, so it can be costly to experiment with them. So I would say, do some research, get ones that sound good to start out with, and seem like they'll be useful for your playstyle, and work on getting those maxed out. It also goes without saying, you might eventually want to have a PvP loadout, and a PvE loadout. There isn't a huge number of weapons in Red Dead Online, but they are very well balanced, with one caveat that we'll touch on shortly. Your character is able to hold two sidearms, which are pistols, revolvers, sawn-off shotgun, etc, and two long weapons, one on the shoulder, one on the back. And then you also can carry throwing weapons like dynamite, throwing knives, tomahawks, as well as a melee weapon. In order to carry two sidearms, you will need an offhand holster, which you can buy in the catalogue once you hit a certain rank. It is possible to dual wield sidearms by drawing them both out at the same time. Just about every weapon in the game will kill with one shot to the head. Revolvers and pistols are decent at short to mid range, same as repeaters, which are a little slower to fire, but have a bit more range and power. Rifles are of course your long range weapons which pack astonishing power, but low fire rate. Shotguns are very powerful and one hit kill at close to medium range. Then you have things like the bow and throwing knives which are your silent weapons. For the most part, every weapon is good in its own way. There isn't exactly a best weapon, so just go with whatever weapon suits your sense of style. That said, if you really want to be super meta, then you'd probably be wanting to use stuff like the Lancaster, the pump action or repeating shotgun, the bolt action, maybe some semi-auto pistols for PvP. My preferred loadout is a navy revolver, a Lamat as my off weapon, a Litchfield repeater, and a double barrel shotgun. The bolt action is a really good weapon too, it's just so fun to use. Whereas it might not have, you know, as long range as like the rolling block or maybe the Kokano. At one time the Varmint rifle was strangely powerful, but I'm not sure if that's still the case, they might have uh, adjusted it by now. One tip I can give you for weapons, let's say you're blasting away with your navy revolver, you use all six shots. Instead of reloading, you can quickly swap to your offhand, or your repeater, or your other long weapon. Then if you swap back to your navy a bit later, it will have automatically reloaded whilst holstered. Now, I mentioned the game's balanced well, right? It is, until you take into account special ammo types. Once you get higher in rank, you'll be able to buy recipes that let you craft explosive ammo, incendiary ammo, and so on. These turn the game's PvP modes into a complete joke. Even though I can craft them too, I can use them if I want to. I don't like it because lower level players can't use them which I think makes it completely unfair. If you're a new player, you go into a PvP mode, and some higher level guy just pops you with an incendiary or an explosive, which is a one hit kill, irrespective of where they shoot you. They don't even need to shoot you, they can shoot next to you and make you fall over, and then they can like unload into you. I don't like that. I think that's ridiculous and shouldn't be allowed. They should only be allowed in free roam. All like special PvP modes should disable ammo types and tonics. 
So if you're wanting to do PvP, be prepared for people to obliterate you with these ammo types unless you're in this special game mode that sometimes comes into rotation where they're not allowed. That should be every game mode. There is no counter for it, other than to use it yourself. That said, one tip for PvE stuff, you can unlock a recipe around level 28 for split point ammo. If you are patient, then I would say you should definitely buy that recipe because it allows you to craft your normal bullets into special split point bullets. And the only thing you need is a knife and the normal bullets. This means you can carry, for example, instead of just 100 normal ammo, you can have 100 normal ammo and 100 split point ammo, which is also a little higher damage, a little more accurate and gives you an extra few experience per kill, which is nice. The only downside is it can take a while to stand there or rather sit there individually crafting all of these bullets, but you can just hold down with one finger and alt tab or check your phone. Plus, these count as crafting, which is perfect for daily challenges like craft X amount of items. You'll always have an easy thing on hand to do. Your main mode of transportation in Red Dead Online. Horses can be deceptive in some ways. If you just start out the game and your friend who's level 100 blitzes off into the distance and you can't keep up, don't think you need to spend hundreds of dollars or gold to get a good horse like he has. That really isn't the case, trust me. Having compared the fastest horse in the game with the best saddle, the best equipment, and the slowest horse in the game, the difference in speed is absolutely minimal. You don't need to worry about the speed stat and stats in general. That said, if there is one stat to be aware of, it's your horse's total stamina. This is effectively the only important stat. When you first get your horse, it will have lower stats. As you use it, as you bond with it, those stats will increase. Once your horse is at maybe level two or three, you can regenerate your horse's stamina by hitting in the left stick on a gamepad once every 25 seconds or so. This will cause you to pat your horse and calm it down. And you know, at these higher bond levels, it will regenerate a chunk of stamina which means unless your horse has like zero base stamina, you can effectively run forever. So ride around on your horse, stroke it, brush it, feed it, hitch it to posts when you're not using it, and soon enough you will have a good horse. You do not need horse insurance. If your horse dies, it will come back to life after you pay a few dollars to heal it. Horse insurance just means that it will come back to life for free instead. So you have to sort of weigh it up. Four dollars a death and it costs, I don't know, a hundred some dollars for insurance. Eventually it will pay for itself if your horse is prone to uh, accidents. You can buy and stable various horses along with vehicles that are tied to the rolls. You will need to buy a new stable slot for every additional horse, but frankly you only need one horse. Having more is just if you want to have a different horse for a different occasion. Horses will have different behaviours too. Some horses might be more prone to bucking when predators are near, but that's a hidden stat and something you'll just have to sort of figure out for yourself, really. Some people say, oh, the Arabians buck constantly. Some people say the war horses never buck. From my experience, every horse will buck when there's a predator near at some point. When you're looking at equipment, however, the only stuff that really has a gameplay impact for your horse would be saddlebags, saddles, and stirrups. Saddlebags determine how many outfits you can hold. I believe standard saddles can hold three outfits, upgraded ones can hold five, and the collector's saddlebag can hold seven. So clearly that is the most important thing, right? Actually seven isn't enough space for all my outfits. I've got standard hot weather, cold weather, cold weather hunting, hot weather hunting, standard hunting, city wear, poker outfit, bounty hunting, and so on. But we didn't talk much about outfits. When you go to a wardrobe in a general store or your camp, you can create your outfits. You can save your custom outfits and then you can store some of them on your horse. I would say the important thing is to make sure you have hot weather outfit on your horse, standard weather and cold weather. If you're using Celsius, which you should be because Fahrenheit is ridiculous, then the easiest way to think about it is that zero Celsius and below, you want to be wearing cold. Zero to 20, you want to be wearing average. 20 and above, you want to be wearing hot weather. If you're in Fahrenheit, I don't know, because Fahrenheit is silly. 
Thankfully, the game lets you swap to Celsius. As for saddles, these will improve your horse's core drain rates. Some of the saddles also have hidden bonuses to them, such as the Nagadoches saddle, which gives you some bonus stats. Stirrups will also give you more on the speed stat too, but again, these stats aren't really very important. Stamina is the one, I mean stamina and health are more important than the others, I would say. When you're in the actual race modes, the game seems to normalise your stats anyway. But I felt it was worth mentioning because I know some people want to be, you know, they want to be as maxed out and as meta as possible. If you're looking for a horse that will just have really high health and stamina, because of course having more health means your horse is less likely to explode after you fall off a rock, then the Cladrubas and Gypsy Cobs from Trader and Naturalist role respectively have, I believe, maxed out health and stamina once you get the highest tier of them and maximum bond. But yeah, at the end of the day, get whatever horse appeals to you. And no, there are no Crimson Stallions for you cowpokes looking to have your own red hair. Sorry. In addition, you can get lanterns for your horse from the tr collector role, I think, which help you see at night, which is nice. Seeing is good. The camp is your base of operations in Red Dead Online. You can rest, cook, craft, and so on. Upgrading your tent will increase the rate at which your cores recover whilst in camp. You can buy things like stew parts from the trader roll for infinite food, fast travel posts for fast travel, and so on. If you're in a posse, then the camp will become the camp for your posse. All of your tents will be here, which is cool. Forming a persistent posse, which is like a clan, will cost a few hundred dollars, but can be useful to have. You can choose where your camp is set up in the world. I went for Big Valley, one of my favourite areas, and a nice centralised location. Trips is your camp manager, and if you have the trader role, he'll be the one helping you sell animal goods. If you're seeing the dreaded Crips packed up your camp messages, that probably means there's too many people in your session. Every player has their own camp. If you are in a posse, you share one camp. Needless to say, if you have like 15 people in a session, then maybe they all want to have their camp in the same place, they can overlap, which means one of them is going to get packed up. If this happens, you can pay to set it down again, or you can just join a new session, and then your camp should be there. Thankfully, I've not seen that problem happening for months now, but I thought I would tell you the solution beyond paying, just in case. Likewise, if you want to get from one end of the map to the other, option A is to travel there manually, option B is to fast travel for a few dollars, option C, use the game's online menu to move to a new session in that area. For example, when you go into online you can choose to start in New Hanover, New Austin, Amberino, Le Moyne. you can choose where to start. It won't put you at the exact location, but if you're in Tumbleweed, and you want to get to Saint Denis, which is on the other side of the map, you can just start a new session and load up in Le Moyne, which is going to put you a lot closer to there. Nice thing to know. The camp also contains a lockbox where you can pick up mail and bonuses from Rockstar. If you use your catalogue to order some food, for example, they will instantly show up in that lockbox, thanks to the power of cowpoke instant delivery. In addition, if you raise the camp's white flag, other players will not be able to attack you whilst you're in camp. This is an extension of the game's offensive and defensive playstyles. If you're in defensive mode, you won't really be able to deadeye other players, nor they you, and you'll take less damage if they start blasting at you. But you'll be locked out of certain things, such as attacking rival player operations. By default, free roam is the main mode in Red Dead Online. Here you can hunt, explore, take on story and stranger missions, and so on. There's also free roam events that you might get invited to. These are game modes that start up every now and then. You'll get more of them unlocked depending on if you have more roles unlocked. But if you see something like, you've been invited to Railroad Baron, that is the game itself inviting you. Some of these free roam events are cooperative, some are competitive. Story missions are one-time missions that progress the story of the online mode, whereas stranger missions are things that reset every day or so, allowing you to do favours for various characters in the environments. Some are new faces, others you will recognise from the story mode, with a few nice surprises to boot. Stranger missions don't really pay out much, so there's not a huge point to doing them. Story missions can be repeated in a sense, in that you can replay them to get higher scores, and you can go on call 
which is basically matchmaking to join another player. As for roles, these are what you might consider classes. Each role has 20 levels to go through and unlocks various things to benefit your experience. These can also be great for making money or experience. So the rest of this video will focus on each one, explaining how good they are for making money, good ways to level them up, and so on. Each role costs a bunch of gold to unlock and gets its own unique outfits and horses. So let's get started. Sadly, Bounty Hunter is perhaps one of the worst roles in Red Dead Online. There isn't a story to it really and the financial gains are limited. The best thing I'll say you get out of maxing it out is the ability to revolver us a lot your guns like an absolute madman. In essence, bounty hunting works in that you choose a bounty, you go find him, then you bring him back dead or alive. Alive is better. There are legendary bounties who have a bit of a mini story to them and these some of these are pretty cool and fun. They can be repeated on increasing difficulties that might add new elements to the bounties as well. One of the rewards you'll get from bounty hunting is the bounty wagon, a way for you to securely lock up a bunch of people all at once. Because yes, some bounties want you to bring in a whole group. I would say this is one of the worst roles if you're just looking for money. You can pick up the role in roads. Some of the rewards you can unlock include a reinforced rope, weapon spinning tricks, the bounty wagon, exclusive roll outfits, and an eye patch. Some of the best ways to level up the role. Just take on bounties, deliver them with as little time remaining as possible. As in, don't deliver them quickly, wait until the timer is near the end, even if that seems counterproductive. Find a legendary bounty that you like and grind it out for higher difficulty some more XP too. For example, I just kept doing the Yukon Nick bounty over and over. <laughs> In my opinion, Trader is the easiest way to get money in the game. In essence, you will hunt animals and bring them back to camp, where crypts will turn the raw materials into items that you'll be selling. Once you have gathered a full set and given crypts time to create the goods, you can then deliver the goods to a buyer, either a long distance or a short distance. Short distance awards around $500, whereas a long distance is around $650. Other players have the option of attacking your operation too. And if you have other players in your posse whilst you are making the delivery, they'll get some money too, which is really nice, even if they don't have the trader role unlocked. As well as delivering crypts, animal skins, and carcasses, you'll need to resupply his equipment, such as tanning fluids. This is done by either a short mission or paying some money to restock. To start the role, you need to speak with Crips about it after he sends you the letter. It lets you unlock the camp stew pot, delivery wagons, and so on. Best way to make use of the role? Level it up enough until you get the hunting wagon, then load that up with three star animal carcasses. Deer, wolves, mountain lions, and so forth, all good options. Then hand them in all at once. It can be a good posse endeavor too. Everyone in your posse can all deliver materials to the camp. In terms of leveling it up quickly, well, just make as many deliveries as you can. Collector is the best role in terms of large payouts and EXP rewards. If you're up to the work, that is. After you find Madame Nazar in the world and pay for the initial investment, you'll be given a list of various collectibles to go out and find in the world. It's worth pointing out that you can pick most of these up even if you don't have the collector role. These will be things like sets of coins, treasure, family heirlooms, collectible cards, fossils, rare eggs, and so on. Once you have an entire set, such as a full house of cards, you can then sell it to Nazar for a large amount of money. You can sell her items individually too, but as she'll point out, you probably shouldn't as you'll get a lot less money. So you should only really do that if you have the max amount of an item and want to make room for more of it. If you pick up every single collectible and sell them all to her, all at once, you will get an obscene amount of experience and thousands of dollars. She'll sell various goods to help you on this endeavour too. Some are deceptively useless. However, you should definitely pick up the metal detector and the shovel from her as soon as you can. Don't bother buying her maps, they are overpriced, don't even always lead you to a new item or one that you need to finish your collection. Instead, use the incredible community resource of the collector's map. There's a link to it in the description, and it's an amazing tool. 
As for good rewards from the collector role, well for starters, going to Madame Nazar is how you'll get a lot of other role rewards, such as hats or trinkets from unlocking them in the roles, but also for specifically collector, you get the collector saddlebag, more outfits, the horse lantern, more light, and the best ability of all, allowing your horse to pick up herbs without you dismounting, which is incredible. <laughs> The Moonshiner is almost an evolution of the Trader, but in terms of money, it's inferior. Weird, huh? Still, the Moonshiner comes with its own story mode that isn't too long, but it's fun to play through as it has its own little set of characters to enjoy. This role isn't so much for the money-generating potential, as it is a chance to enhance the flavour of the world, no pun intended. You can get your own Moonshine Shack complete with upgrades that allow you to dance, play music with a band, serve drinks to other players, and just... It's somewhere for you to hang out. I don't know if there's like, roleplay things in Red Dead Online, I know that was like quite a big thing in um, GTA Online, but it's good for stuff like that, you know? The actual role entails creating a recipe of moonshine, waiting for it to brew, then delivering it to buyers. Be warned that moonshine is volatile and delicate, so you have to be very careful when delivering it not to crack bottles. Plus, you have to contend with roadblocks from those pesky revenue agents who are also, like, Terminators because they're way more powerful than other NPCs. Moonshiner is one of the cooler roles, which adds a lot to the world and has fun things to do, it just isn't great for making money. And if you want to level it up fast, you can do the story missions, you can do bootlegger missions, you can do your deliveries. The bootlegger missions have a cooldown, the story missions might have a cooldown as well, I forget, and you can do them on higher difficulties as well, you can keep replaying them. But just try and make the highest level recipe you can and deliver it, with all the bottles intact if possible, and you'll be there in no time. The latest and last role for the time being. Naturalist started over in Strawberry. The point of Naturalist is not to kill animals, but to sedate them. You will need to buy Trank ammo from Harriet, or craft it yourself. This ammo can only be used in the Varmint Rifle. You'll need to keep shooting animals with sedatives until you hear a distinct sort of chime and you see the crosshair go a dark red upon the hit. That means the animal has been sedated and will shortly after pass out, allowing you to approach and take a sample from it. Then you take this sample to Harriet, sell it to her. Once you've sold an entire collection or set's worth, you can then get an extra amount of money by handing in the set and resetting it. A little like Collector, only you don't need to sell them together. You can individually sell samples one by one, without any problems. Good way to level up Naturalist, simply sedate and study every new animal you see, whilst also doing Harriet's legendary animal missions and her poaching missions as often as you can. On the flip side, Naturalist is also related to Gus. You have to see the intro cutscene to be able to talk to Gus, I believe. Either way, Gus is a man who will ask you to bring legendary animal skins to him, so you can turn them into equipment. Whilst it's up to you, I would suggest sample an animal the first time, kill it and skin it and take the skin to Gus the second time, or wait until you've maxed out Naturalist completely and you don't need to bother about leveling up with Harriet and her being mad at you for killing animals. If you kill too many, she will spray you with nonsense and not talk to you for a few minutes. Gus also sells trinkets. If you sell him the items required, such as beaver tooth and some jewellery, then you can buy the trinket which will be crafted with those components. To reiterate, you need to sell him the components and then he will have them with which to craft. And these trinkets can boost your stats just by having the item owned, a lot like the trinkets in the single player campaign. Also, keep an eye out for the Protect Legendary Animal Free Roam events you'll be invited to, good chance to snag a sample you may be missing. Naturalist also has the ability to turn into animals. Harriet will give you a free one for a deer, I believe, and you can buy others from her for gold. These are little pamphlets that essentially teach you how to commune with the animal world. You'll need to pick up five of the Harriet herb, then take it to a special location, use it, and you'll transform into an animal. It's rather pointless, it's just a fun little distraction for you. And that about covers it for this starter guide, however. If there's anything I didn't cover, feel free to ask in the comments down below. Likewise, feel free to share any tips of your own, as mentioned earlier. If there's a new role that came out in the time since I made this video, and you have questions about that, do feel free to ask, as there's a good chance I will know. For now, thank you so much for watching, I hope this video was useful. Until next time, see you later, cowpoke.